Lecture 19, Query Optimization. Imagine you're given an assignment in a course and you're going to do it now. As Arnold will tell you, come on, do it, do it now. What are you waiting for? All right, assuming that it is a non-trivial assignment, uh, then you probably need to do something along the lines of the following three steps. Number one, figure out exactly what the assignment is asking you to do. Figure out how you're going to do it. Uh, and this is often um, important because you'll find out uh, part two depends on part one, uh, or you need to complete something else before you complete this, or sometimes it's even okay, you need to go look something up uh, before you can get started on this. You, you need to come up with a plan. And then finally, step three is to do it. Uh, and the goal of our topic of discussion today is really to focus on step two, that, that part about figuring out how to do the assignment. And we'll use the database and query optimization as an example, even though the topic is applicable in different contexts. You don't have to have taken a databases course previously, although presumably some familiarity with uh, SQL uh, or um, SQL as it's sometimes called, database will help with uh, understanding. Uh, and depending on how the topic was covered in your database course, uh, whether this topic was covered directly or if you looked at my EC356 notes um, for, some, uh, for some purpose to study or just to learn about it yourself or something like that, this might seem actually entirely familiar because that sort of thing is uh, covered also in EC356. Okay, digression over. As far as the database is concerned, the plan is really the same, the, th the high level plan. Um, it does parsing and translation, optimization and evaluation. And parsing and translation is interpreting the provided query into some sort of form that the computer can work with. Right? The, the thing that you provided is in human readable text, even if it is SQL, uh, and it needs to take that and make an internal representation of it. Step two is optimization. We'll talk about whether that's the right name in just a little bit, uh, but it's about figuring out how best to carry out the query that we would like to do. Uh, and then there is evaluation. Uh, and evaluation is execution of the query according to the plan as it has been developed. So once we have chosen the plan in step two, evaluation is the actual step of carrying out whatever it is that we have planned to do. Now, if we take a, a quick look at the first step, right, uh, it is scanning to figure out where are the keywords, what is what. Right? We have to interpret the um, provided text, and that means scanning it to find the keywords. Aha, we've identified that select is a keyword, so we know something to, to do with that. Uh, we then know, based on the syntax rules for the language, what certain things mean, you know, where certain things are. Okay, the thing that follows from select is, is this, it's that. All of those things are important. Once that's done, we have uh, all of the things identified. There is a need to uh, check the syntax to make sure that we are in fact uh, looking at a valid query. Um, it's not missing something important. It doesn't have extra things. It doesn't have weird random semicolons where they shouldn't be. Um, all of the things that are necessary for actually validating the uh, query. Uh, and assuming that that is the case, then there's going to be making a query graph, which is identifying the various paths that we could take to actually complete the query. That's where we're going to focus. Uh, and then there is actually following the plan, carrying it out. This is not really about parsing and interpreting and all of that. Uh, if you took a compiler course, uh, you probably talked about uh, parsing and that sort of thing. Uh, to validate syntax and things of that nature. Um, it's nothing that we are going to talk about uh, right now. We'll just say that a query that is not well formed, it has a syntax error, uh, even a semantic error that we could detect uh, at a high level, uh, is rejected uh, and it just goes no further through the process. We don't make a plan to do something that is not possible uh, or is otherwise, um, uh, otherwise not well formed. So let's not focus on that. Um, now, usually the query is expressed in SQL, that is to say the structured query language, and this is the human readable form that we are fairly used to uh, if you've ever written some database stuff. 
Um, and it needs to be translated into an equivalent relational algebra expression. If you're not familiar with it, relational algebra, super briefly, um, is just the set theory representation of database operations. Um, that is to say that we usually think about database operations formally uh, in terms of set theory. Um, a relation contains tuples and um, we, we can do a bunch of set operations where we're looking for the intersection between these two things. That sort of stuff uh, is viewed as set theory. Uh, and if you covered it in a database course, you'll know what I'm talking about. We have tried to minimize the amount of uh, relational algebra and set theory that appears in this topic because it's not the focus. Um, the focus is on the idea of how do we come up with a plan for doing what we want to do. Uh, and uh, then we will uh, explain any relational algebra that we come across. Given a sufficiently complex query, uh, it does need to be broken down into query blocks. Uh, and the query blocks are just like subparts, if you will. Uh, when you are faced with an exam question, especially if it's an exam question that I wrote that where the intention is for you to write it using a pen and paper uh, in the physical activities complex, the question is typically broken down into subparts. On part A, I want you to do the setup. In part B, I want you to implement the communication between these two different threads. And in part C, I want you to launch the threads. In part D, I want you to do the cleanup. Uh, in that sense, it's already subdivided for you. The database server is not necessarily provided you know, the subdivided form. Uh, it is more likely it's been given the whole query and, say, and told, please do this. Uh, and so it will uh, break it down into query blocks, which is just the same thing really as saying subparts. Uh, and the subparts are going to be um, then themselves treated as relational algebra expressions. Uh, a query block consists of a select from where kind of expression as well as any of the related group by and having clauses. Uh, and we can also consider nested queries as a separate block. Uh, if you're not super familiar with the database stuff, uh, what's all this going on about um, select from where, you'll see as we get through sort of the next examples, uh, group by and having are, are used for aggregation kind of things. You want to find the sum of salaries or if you wanted to identify you know, the departments which have more than seven team members, um, the group by and having clauses are important uh, for, for those kinds of things. Um, but let's again not get not get too caught up uh, on on the actual database stuff. But nevertheless, we have to break down the task into subquery. So a query like select salary from employee where salary is greater than one hundred thousand consists of one query block. It's a single select from where, uh, and there's no associated other clauses that, that go with it. And that's a pretty simple case. And just looking at it off the cuff, we can probably think of two ways to do what we want to do. This doesn't cover all the details, but at the very least at a high level, we can think about uh, two operations. There's selection and projection. So selection is choosing which of the tuples, these are the rows of the table, uh, are relevant to our query and projection is getting rid of columns that we do not need. Uh, and since we're interested in salary, uh, where salary is greater than 100,000, uh, we could go about it by doing the select first. So first find all the rows where the salary is more than 100,000 and then throw away the columns that we don't need uh, from the result. I guess it's important to keep in mind we're not changing the underlying data when we do this. Like when we select the rows, we're like copying them to a different location. For example, uh, and when I say throw away stuff, we're not deleting um, any data that's actually in the database that we actually need uh, because select is not a, uh, an operation that does changes. Um, the other alternative is to do the projection first. So just get the salary column uh, and then do the selection on the much smaller intermediate relation, uh, the intermediate table that only contains the salary. Either of those sounds like it will work as an approach. We have two steps and fortunately in this case we could do these steps in either order. What a coincidence for this example. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves what order do we want to do them in uh, and sort of what makes the most sense. 
If we have a subquery, uh, then it looks more like this, where we select name, street, city, province, and postal code from address where ID is in, and then in parentheses is the subquery, select address ID from employee where department equals development. Uh, and this is supposed to find the mailing addresses for all of the employees uh, where they are in the development department. And uh, we have two query blocks to work on here. Uh, one for the subquery, so the thing in parentheses that gets the address IDs from, uh, from the uh, employee table. Uh, and then we have an outer query, uh, and this is gonna use the result from the subquery to identify the addresses for everybody. So if, uh, in this case, we have two query blocks, there's no reason why we have to follow the same strategy for executing each of these. In fact, most likely we will choose different ones for each of them uh, because we want to make the best decision we can make given the information that we have and the more information that we have, uh, the better decisions we can make. And therefore we should expect, um, we should expect <laughs> that uh, using this information uh, will ideally result in a better outcome. So what we're interested in is a query execution plan. You know, and as Blackadder would say, uh, I've got a plan so cunning, you could put a tail on it and call it a weasel. Um, and so the plan is, as discussed, this idea of we need to figure out um, what we're going to do. Uh, and this plan um, needs to be built up. And to build up the plan, we need certain annotations. The annotations will tell us how to evaluate the operation, including stuff like what algorithm are we going to use uh, for carrying something out. And we'll talk about some of these things a little bit later on. Uh, but an example you know, algorithm is, you know, do we scan every row of the table? Uh, do we sort the, the row of the table first? Uh, and then we go off of uh, the sorted version. It really depends. So those kinds of things will be built up as the steps and the annotations tell us how to do each sub-step. Now, an algebraic operation with the associate annotations about how to do it uh, is referred to as an evaluation primitive and these are the individual steps of the larger plan, uh, which is how exactly to carry out the query. We'll see as we get into an example a little bit more uh, about building up the annotations and sort of what is our strategy uh, and we'll give uh, perhaps uh, a relatable example that will be helpful in terms of making, making this a bit more clear. So if there are multiple ways based on our potential, uh, you know, potential routes, if there are in fact multiple things that we could do, um, then we need to make a decision about which of those we want to follow. And this is not a problem we can give away. It's not expected that users will um, implement, um, will implement optimal queries, right? Um, the database is especially uh, in the, uh, responsible in this because the way that uh, SQL works as a language is uh, it's expecting the form of the result, right? You provide, this is what I want, you know, please select for me the addresses of everybody in development and it's the responsibility of the database server to figure out how to do it. This contrasts with what we're used to from other languages like you know, C or Rust, which are more imperative, where you say, I want you to do this, then do this, then do the next thing. So you're, you're choosing most likely in that case, the algorithm where you say, I want to iterate over this collection uh, and I want to uh, select the items that are in it that match whatever we are looking for. Um, that's a, a very different way of specifying what you want as compared to the database. With the database, you just say, this is what I want and it's your job to give it to me. So as the database uh, server, you can't actually just require that people write optimal queries. Uh, it's your job to figure out to deliver the thing that has been asked for. So the database server should choose the best approach via query optimization. Uh, although I think it's fair to say that maybe optimization is not the, the correct word for this. Why not the correct word? Well, the thing is we're not necessarily choosing the optimal approach. Instead, we're gonna make some estimates about the query plans. We're going to uh, try our best to estimate what we think the um, cost of doing this is, and we'll make a decision based on those estimates. 
This suggests, as you may imagine, uh, we're going to use some heuristics uh, and that we are also going to trade some accuracy for time because it may not be possible to know absolutely everything and absent that uh, you know we're going to make our uh, decision based on partial information uh, which may be less accurate but we'll have an answer sooner. Okay so let's imagine that you are asked to drive your car from point A to point B. I ask Google uh, and uh, Google, I say, you know, please uh, guide me to my destination and it is more than happy to present to me this route. Uh, and the route is you know, highlighted here on the screen in blue. And the route is generally associated with a time estimate, right? Um, it's, it's not just, you know, here's how you get there, um, but it also has a time estimate. You know, in you know, uh, <laughs> ancient history now, in a way, uh, you know, before you could use Google Maps for this kind of thing, um, you could, you know, ask, um, you could ask for directions from, say, other uh, services, and they would just give you the route, but they wouldn't give you a time estimate necessarily because it was hard to know uh, without some real time information. Okay, that's a hint. That's a hint. But yeah, how does Google present the time estimate? I'll let you think about it for just a minute. Okay, as you will imagine, the route is composed of various different segments, and you can see that a little bit in the uh, blue line, having the yellow segments that represent you know, areas that are a little bit slower for whatever reason. Um, and it is breaking down the trip into various different pieces. Um, and so the first piece here is drive along University Avenue, um, continuing to Highway 85. You, you get on Highway 85, you continue down, um, keep going, you know, merges onto uh, Highway 401, all of that stuff, whatever the steps of the trip are. And each segment has a particular length. Um, so we know it is you know, X meters from you know, 200 University Avenue West to the intersection uh, at Phillips Street, uh, and then you know, further you know, X meters for the next segment and, and Y meters for the next. And uh, when you're driving on 401, you probably measure it in kilometers, but it's fine. Um, and each segment has a speed. Google has some idea about speed limits, but also typical speed, but also some real-time traffic data so it, they can estimate uh, exactly how long it would take um, to get from where you are to where you're going or you know, from the start point to the end point. Uh, and by combining all of these segments, you get an estimate of how long a, a particular route will take. Uh, and so, so, okay, so segment one is you know, getting to the highway and we know that that's going to take 10 minutes and then you know, the next segment on the highway is, is going to take seven minutes. Uh, before you have to merge into something else and then there's another segment and so on. Once you've added all of those up, you get a total estimate. Uh, and that applies to one route. And if there are multiple potentially valid routes, there's only one route shown here uh, in this particular example. Um, the, there's only the one route shown. Uh, but if there are multiple potentially valid routes, then you would add up uh, each of those uh, for each route uh, and you would get an estimate for each route. And in the end, you could say, aha, you know, route one has a, a total time of say one hour and seven minutes and route two has a total time of one hour and 12 minutes uh, and route three has an hour of one hour and four minutes and you say route three is the best that's the one that you would recommend uh, google obviously can't make you drive that route you can deviate from it if you want you know free will exists at least as far as we know uh, and you can uh, you can choose to disobey google uh, if you think you know better uh, if you're sure that uh, you know a better route, that's perfectly fine. And we will eventually you know, find out. Um, so if we do it for all the viable routes, we've already talked a little bit about the idea of like generating alternatives um, and you know, how many different routes do you want to consider and um, how, how difficult it is to determine how many routes and when do we give up. But let's say we've evaluated all viable routes, we'll get one that's best. But of course, every month is bad lane change month. Um, it is not always predictable what is going to happen. Um, the unfortunate reality of life is that things happen. There is a snowstorm, there is a crash, 
um, there is construction, whatever it is results in sort of you know, unexpected traffic uh, and you can end up seeing, you know, there's a big red segment here um, because um, ultimately something happened, right? You know, our prediction um, that we want to take this particular route turns out to be wrong. That's fine. Um, short of being able to see into the future, it is really hard to know um, which route is going to be optimal. Uh, there is no easy way to predict where a crash is going to happen. I mean, if you could figure out how to do that, I would be very impressed. Um, but realistically, there's you know, no way to, to know that. Uh, and that applies as well um, for the database, right? Um, we put an estimate on a plan. The estimate could be wrong. We don't know for sure. Um, what is going to happen because we can't see into the future. Okay, so given that, we've sort of come up with a plan um, and uh, our plan is we need to assign costs to each segment uh, and based on that we can make an estimate of what we think is going to be the total time uh, and the total time for each route. Good, but in terms of actually um, putting uh, time on a segment, we haven't got that figured out yet. For driving, we can say, aha, the average speed on, on this route you know, at this time of day is typically you know, 30 kilometers an hour because it's signed at 50 and traffic is moderate. Uh, and between you know, traffic and red lights and, and all of that, you know, the actual practical speed is, is 30. That's possible. Um, but in terms of where does time go in executing the query, um, it is most likely the case that the limiting factor is loading stuff from disk. Um, disk operations, and we're talking like magnetic hard disk, uh, is going to be the actual limiting factor. Um, and I mean, we can improve this by the use of SSDs, but many large databases still use hard disk drives just because it's a little bit impractical to store a very large database uh, on SSDs. The price of the SSDs is, is still a lot more uh, than it, it would be for an equivalent size of um, magnetic hard drives. Um, CPU speeds are pretty fast to the point where even memory accesses seem slow from the perspective of the CPU. So we're going to just uh, imagine for the sake of our discussion today that um, disk is the real cost. Uh, CPU time is non-zero in reality, but we will pretend for the uh, simplicity of our discussion today that it's zero. Uh, and we will just um, only use disk accesses for cost. So based on that, um, the number of block transfers, that is you know, data being moved into and out of memory, and the number of disk seeks, that is repositioning uh, the head of the magnetic drive uh, on the disk we're reading from, are the important measures of interest here. SSDs don't have seek time and they have faster transfer speeds, but the number of block transfers is still relevant um, because the volume of data that we have to move is still an important factor in calculating how long it takes to execute the operation that we are planning to do. Okay, uh, to compute the operation um, estimate, we uh, use the formula B times T sub T plus S times T sub S. Uh, and B is the number of block transfers, T sub capital T is the time to transfer, S is the number of seeks, uh, and T sub S is the time that it takes to seek. For magnetic hard drive transfer time, so moving one block from disk to memory or vice versa, is about 0 0.1 milliseconds, uh, and seek times are about 4 milliseconds. That does seem pretty slow, um, but that's the, that's the time frame on which we have to operate. Um, and so there's a few things that we'll uh, note in um, our estimating strategy, um, which is uh, you know, our caveats, terms and conditions apply, thanks Legal Eagle. Um, and the biggest one is that we usually um, estimate and imagine based on the worst case scenario. Life is like, not always <laughs> as bad as we're going to imagine uh, in our situation, but um, we'll talk about the, the worst case scenarios. Um, one thing to, to mind is that sometimes writes can be twice as expensive as reads. Um, this is because a disk subsystem might read back the written data to verify that the write succeeded, 
but we're going to assume that doesn't happen here. Um, similarly, at this first level, um, we don't include the amount of time it takes to write a final result back. Um, if we're just doing a select query where we're just retrieving data, there's no changes that need to be made, but an update query does actually change the stuff on, uh, on disk. So uh, if that counted, it would matter, but we're gonna say we'll ignore that for now. Um, and uh, the size of memory makes a big difference. Right? How much time we spend transferring data in and out of, of memory is an important consideration. If memory is very large, then we have to spend much less time transferring data in and out of memory. Uh, if data is uh, small and memory is large in comparison, uh, or alternatively, um, you know, we just have an absurd amount of RAM available to us, then we're not as worried. But we're going to do a worst case scenario, uh, and that worst case scenario says only one block per relation, so one block per table, can be in memory uh, at uh, any given time. If we're wrong, uh, and in that case wrong means you know, the data we need is already in memory, the actual cost is less than the estimated cost, which usually we would consider to be better than the alternative. Now if, uh, if you imagine that it's going to take X amount of time to complete uh, an operation, it only takes you know, half as much, um, that's, uh, you're probably pretty happy with that, honestly. Um, it's, it's much better than you know, telling you that it's gonna take you know, X amount of time and it takes two X, at least I would imagine. Your preferences may vary. Um, and the estimates that we are going to use um, calculate really only the amount of work that we think it will take to complete the operation. Um, it doesn't account for any other things uh, that could be going on that potentially affect the, the real world performance. Right? Um, we don't care about these things because they're impossible to predict in advance and you know, there's there's no point in sort of uh, wasting our time imagining things that we can do very little about so uh, just just to think about what do you think these sort of external factors would be that we might need to deal with in real life but won't consider in this discussion Okay, so a few things that uh, I can think of, um, how busy the system is. If we are doing a lot of things concurrently, then uh, there is of course a distinct possibility that there's uh, just waiting our turn because we have lots of other stuff going on uh, that we can kind of do nothing about. Uh, it's you know, outside of our control, so that's a possibility. Um, another one is what is in the buffer. Uh, if we have recently looked at this data and that data is currently sitting in memory or, or sitting in a cache somewhere uh, or otherwise just uh, hanging around in a more convenient location than on disk, um, then yeah, uh, we could actually end up you know, doing better than we had originally envisioned. Um, and a third thing is the data layout. So this is about how is the data actually stored? Um, if it's you know, formatted well, packed well on disk, we need to do fewer seek operations or maybe shorter ones um, than operations. Similarly, uh, if the data is spread across several physical disks, um, and then maybe we could do some reads in parallel. Uh, we will assume that's not happening in our examples, um, but potentially um, life could be a little bit better than you know, we have imagined just based on uh, the worst case scenario that we're going to talk about. Finally, um, you can think of lots of other factors probably that will affect it in reality. Um, in, it's important to keep in mind that the estimate uh, is just an educated guess that we will use to plan how to do the work. It's not a promise on exactly how long it will take. Uh, and the other thing to note is that the lowest cost approach is not necessarily the fastest. Sometimes we can go faster by using more resources, uh, but the approach that the database is likely to take involves uh, lowest cost, which is uh, using the methodology that we are discussing today, fewest disk reads. Um, 
you can think about it in you know, a driving analogy um, that um, you can drive a longer route that involves more highway driving and potentially less time, even if it means more fuel consumption due to the increased distance and increased speed of travel, uh, because wind resistance is proportional to speed and you know, all, all those things. When driving, we usually prefer to choose the lowest time estimate, um, especially if uh, you know, traffic is likely to be bad. You, you just want to get there. Like, <laughs> you're not really that that fussed if you know, it uses one extra liter of fuel, if it means you save a certain amount of time. But there are people, um, and uh, if you search for hyper milers, um, they are really obsessed with getting maximum fuel economy. Their goal is to reduce as much as possible. Uh, their uh, fuel consumption uh, and you know given high fuel prices it doesn't really sound like a bad plan um, but the database is trying to be a hyper miler so to speak okay so we've got some of the ground rules and stuff laid out at this point um, and we're going to think about um, now actually sort of doing some query optimization itself um, and there can exist uh, many different rules uh, that allow transformation of a query into an equivalent. Um, and we're not going to focus actually at all on learning the rules as it would take us really far into the details of, of how the database actually works. It would be completely redundant given uh, that you've uh, likely taken a database course that called it already. Equivalency rules exist. They resemble expression transformation you learned in math. Uh, so you know, multiplication commutes, so 3 times 10 times 7 is the same as 7 times 10 times 3. Um, others add some complexity, but actually might be a useful way to think about the problem, like you know, 14 times 13 is the same as 14 times 10 plus 14 times 3. Um, in any case, um, the thing that we're going to focus on is joins, um, because that's potentially a very big area in which we can make some gains. Now you might be thinking, why joins in particular? Um, joins are frequently expensive just because we are usually combining you know, one or uh, more <laughs> relations. Uh, so we are potentially looking at uh, a lot of data uh, all at once and you know, matching the um, elements from one table to the elements in another that correspond to it tends to be somewhat expensive. So yeah, things, things can get out of hand fairly quickly. Uh, and so joining is expensive. Uh, and for that reason, we are going to focus on it. So let's imagine um, our query, just for the sake of a simple example, uh, involves a selection and a join. Um, so we want to select the employee number, salary address from employee, and their employee ID is 385. Um, let's say that the number, uh, the employee ID number uh, and salary are in the employee table. The employee table has 300 entries because there are 300 people who work for or have worked for this company. Uh, and the address information is in another table that has 12,000 entries. People move, maybe addresses of customers are in there, something like that. Okay, how do we do this? Well, if we took a bad approach, the, the bad approach would have us do something like we compute the join of employees and addresses um, and we produce uh, quite a lot of results, you know, 300 results, and then we do a selection and then we do a projection on the intermediate result. Like why, why is this bad? Um, we end up just producing a lot of intermediate data. Right? We produce a table as the intermediate step that has you know, 300 rows. Each row has the full amount of data from employee and the full amount of data from address. Uh, and then we do a selection and then we do a projection. Uh, so we select the row that we're looking for uh, and then we get the, um, uh, and then we get the columns that we're interested in. And that's a lot. And why did we have all this intermediate data? But if we do it efficiently, then we do a selection and a projection first, um, which is to say we just cut down the number of rows that we're looking for in the employee results to one. We'll assume employee numbers are unique here. Uh, 
Um, and then when we join, we combine it with the address table. We're looking for one entry in that table to correspond to the one employee that we're looking for. So our intermediate result in this case was one row, which had not all the columns in employee. And yet uh, we still get the same result at the end. So we can see that doing this efficiently reduces dramatically the amount of data that we have to um, the amount of data that we have to iterate over, work on, you know, keep in memory, otherwise manage. Now, the query optimizer should systematically generate some equivalent expressions, but since performing all possible transformations and evaluating each option probably takes some non-trivial time, it is likely the optimizer doesn't consider every single possibility and it takes some shortcuts rather than doing it by brute force. Um, and one idea is, as Spock says, remember, um, the idea that if we can reuse common sub-expressions, uh, we can reduce the amount of space uh, that's required by representing expressions during evaluation. If we remember, we looked at this before. Uh, this looks like something we've done before. We know what to do, and we don't have to worry quite so much uh, about uh, you know, remembering every single permutation because we've, we've already seen this before. Okay, now in the previous example, um, I used very precise numbers. I said there were 300 of this and there was one of that and you know, 12,000 of this. Um, but for the database to actually know those kinds of figures, um, it has to, well, look them up or guess. Um, and sometimes you know, certain numbers, like you know, the number of rows in a table, the number of tuples in a relation, is known to us. Um, you know, it's in the metadata, so checking that is very quick, it's very easy. Um, but not everything is necessarily available by looking at metadata. If I want to know how many employees have a salary between $40,000 and $50,000, the only way to be sure is to actually do the query, um, or you know, as Lieutenant Ripley says, nuke it from orbit, it's the only way to be sure. Um, if we don't want to do the query when we're estimating the cost, because that feels kind of silly, you know, if, uh, how long will it take to drive to Toronto? Hang on, let me drive to Toronto, and then I'll tell you how long it will take you to drive to Toronto. Doesn't really work. Um, so in that case, we would have to actually take a guess. Um, and the thing is, um, guessing is, is not easy. Um, it's not necessarily going to give us, again, the optimal result. Um, but the important thing we should keep in mind is we don't have to be perfect. It's not a requirement that we, you know, our guess is absolutely correct. Um, it's not even a requirement that actually it's uh, even all that close to correct. All that matters is that um, our results are better than not optimizing. If we pick the second or third or fifth best option, that might be close to the best option. That might be good enough for our purpose. Um, and so you know, that's what we do. So there are five major areas where cost for actually performing a query can accumulate. We've talked about in our estimation model um, that disk is going to be the biggest one, um, but that's an estimate. Um, and um, well, the, the more nuanced view is the following. So the first one, and probably the biggest, is disk I.O., the previously discussed cost of seeking and data transfer to get data from the disk uh, or you know, some other secondary storage. This is you know, most likely our biggest cost, um, but we'll find out, of course, for sure. Uh, number two is disk additional storage, which is the cost, if any, of storing some intermediate uh, results on disk during the processing of the query. Uh, number three, computation. This is the CPU time that's required to do the operations, including things like sorting, merging, um, any arithmetic operations. If we're averaging a value or summing something up, um, that's an arithmetic operation uh, and is, uh, is counted uh, in the time that we would actually spend doing the thing. Uh, memory, uh, the memory usage for uh, buffers necessary to do the desired operations. Uh, and then communication, uh, which is the cost of sending the results back to the requester, or if we have a distributed database, we might assign an explicit cost to um, fetching the data or communicating between the uh, different nodes of the database, which could exist. 
in a simple scenario, we don't consider distributed databases, and, and that's fine. As we said before, we will generally proceed on the basis that you know, disk I.O. is the biggest cost, uh, and we'll just say that it outweighs everything else. That might not be true in real life, um, but um, you know, we're still going to optimize as best we can uh, based on this. Okay, I also said that there exists metadata about the tables, which is to say some statistical information, uh, data about data, that we could use to find out some things uh, used in calculating our uh, query plan. And anything that's in the metadata, we actually know with reasonably high accuracy, assuming our metadata is kept up to date. Okay, so things that we could easily look up, things that would be easy to find and we wouldn't have to work very hard to get, um, n sub r, the number of tuples in a relation, so how many rows are in this table. Uh, b sub r, the number of blocks containing a relation. So we, if we did have to scan the whole thing, if we were interested in you know, looking over every part of a table, how many disk blocks uh, does, that, uh, does that table take up? Uh, L sub r, the size of in bytes of relation, so how much you know, disk transfer do we have to do? Uh, F sub R, number of tuples of R that fit into one block. So how big is an individual row? Uh, v of A and R, th this is the number of distinct values of R in an, uh, in an uh, attribute A. Um, distinct values are interesting uh, in some cases because, um, for example, if, if it's a Boolean value, you know, true or false, you know, is, um, is insurance enabled? Um, there aren't very many possible values, right? You know, it's, it's true, false, maybe it's empty. Um, that's not as useful as, you know, ID, where, where somebody's user ID, well, that's unique. Um, that should be, you know, there exists one, so it's different for every person. That might actually be interesting. Uh, and the last item in here is the uh, H sub R comma I, which is the height of an index. So how big is the index uh, defined on a particular relation? Um, all of those things are known with pretty high accuracy, again, assuming the metadata is up to date. Uh, and so if we need any of those, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, some of the values can be completed, uh, or completed, can be calculated um, relatively easily. Um, the information is, is there if we need it. And there could exist you know, metadata about the index information, which you might call meta metadata, uh, if you want to be a little bit flippant. Okay, the thing about metadata is it's to a certain extent not free. Um, the more often metadata is updated, the more effort is spent updating it. If you always want it to be as you know, up to date as it can possibly be, uh, that takes a meaningful amount of effort you know, on, on, every, um, on every insert, uh, on every update, uh, on every deletion, what have you, we have to update the metadata associated with uh, that table. And that might be fine. Um, depending on our needs, that might actually be ideal, uh, but there's no guarantee, right? Um, it is entirely possible that uh, we're just wasting our time because no one is ever looking at this. Um, if, if every insertion results in the update, we're spending a lot of time. If we do periodic updates, our statistic data might be a little bit out of date um, when we actually get there. Um, maybe you choose some sort of balanced approach. Uh, where you update the metadata when, say, uh, it's a, a quiet period, when there's not a lot going on, maybe that is you know, sort of optimal uh, to do. Uh, and then you, know, you can think of it in, in a way, sort of a callback to scheduling algorithms you learned about in an operating systems class. Uh, the idea that, oh, maybe updating the, the metadata is kind of a low priority task, uh, and we'll do that only when we have you know, time, you know, when there's nothing better to do, um, which maybe is a good use of our CPU time. Uh, and similarly for things like, okay, well, how many users do we actually have who are um, you know, having a salary between say um, 40 and $50,000? Um, then for something like that, it might actually be meaningful to maintain some heuristics, some histograms, some statistical information. Um, and you know, the values are divided into ranges and you know, we have something that looks 
like the diagram you see here, um, which uh, which tells us about you know, how many tuples are, are in those ranges. Um, a histogram really doesn't take up a lot of space and can help us certain to figure out uh, certain problems. Um, you know, it can answer queries actually just using the metadata. If the query was give me the count of employees who have salaries above one hundred thousand um, dollars, and the heuristics uh, have the category aligned exactly such that you know we know um, one hundred thousand dollars and above is one of the categories, and we know from the heuristics it's ten. That's great. We don't actually have to query the database, uh, the table at all. We can answer the information that we know from the heuristics and. Save, save time, save effort. So that's pretty good. It can be a little bit, um, it can be a little bit um, out of date. So you know, we might actually answer nine when we've just hired an employee and that hasn't been reflected in the metadata just yet. Um, but sometimes that's okay. Again, trading accuracy for time. Uh, and as we said, these are exact. They could be a little out of date. And the more exact values we have, the better our guesses, but things get more interesting when we actually think about uh, something for which we don't have a category. If the largest category, say, is like 100,000 and above, and we ask, you know, how many have a salary above 150,000, um, we know an upper limit based on the uh, metadata that we have, because if we, uh, if we say, okay, we have 12 employees who are in that category of 100,000 and above, and how many of those uh, are 150,000 above, well, maximum it could be 12, but we don't know exactly how many just yet. 